Hello everybody, welcome to episode 149. I am one episode off that 150. Rainy season has just started this morning. Like clockwork. It's usually June the 15th to July the 15th. You can more or less set your calendar by it. But today, on June the 18th, it has started with a vengeance. Rainy season is where Japan gets to pretend it's England for a month where you've got constant rain, constant grey skies, and, yeah, it's it's very England out there. I don't know if you can hear it. Pause for effect. But that's the rain battering against my window. I've had to put my light on just so you can get my face illuminated on YouTube because it's got so dark, dark as well. But unlike England... This weather does not go on for months and months and months. The whole country knows it's only for a month, so they just put up with it. So there's not that dampness getting into your very soul in this country. We know the summer's coming, and we're quite happy about it. So it's just a small price to pay, knowing how great the summer is here. Now, last week, I was talking about age gaps in the world leaders. and Pretty much when I listened back when I was doing the editing, it seemed like I was down on men that go for older women. Now, men that go for older women, in my book, men that go for older women, there is nothing wrong with it when you're younger. If you're 53 years old, like I am now, the man looking at you now, or listening, to, or you're listening to me now, if I start dating older than me, that's not a good look for me, maybe for other people, but I don't want to be dating somebody that's even five years older than me. I don't want to be walking around with a woman who's 58 years old. I'm sorry. You can complain as much as you want. You can direct me as direct message me as much as you want, but I can guarantee all the people I know, all the male, all the males I know, do not want to date older than them because they're the same age as me. Dating younger, 5, 10, even 15 years. If I dated 15 years younger than me, now what would that be? 37. Nobody would bat an eyelid. Nobody would bat an eyelid at me dating a 37-year-old. Now, when I first came to Japan, I came here with a Western girlfriend she soon realized that my head were going to get turned and off off she trotted which were great which were great because when you're when you're chewing on a ratty old cheese sandwich for 10 years and suddenly you become single in the best country for being single in is to live the bar is officially open now i would i would have been 35 years old when i became single and i had a i had a sweet spot i had that sweet spot between 35 and 38 completely single and it was great so i had two two and a half years before i met my wife and then all that went by the wayside but for two and a half years it was fantastic because i was able to date who i wanted and see how I wanted, whenever I wanted. And I had no, I had nobody to answer to, basically. So all that stuff that I missed out on between 25 and 35, I were doing in a short window of about two and a half years. Now, I were going on about Macron and that age gap, which I suppose when he were 15, when he first started seeing her, if you're 15 and you're dating a 30-year-old, how Fucking hot is that? It's not a 30 year old, is it? She's 27. So when you're 15 and you're dating a 42 year old, still quite hot. But I think when you're getting past 44, 45, eesh. yeah, yeah, that wouldn't be for me. I, w I wouldn't have carried it on if I'd have been Macron. Anyway, going back, if we go back to 2006. I was just working on the numbers, which most single 35-year-old fellas 
would do if they were living in a country like this. Now, I was in a bar in Azerbaijan. Now, Azerbaijan is the high class area of Tokyo. Tokyo is expensive. This place is getting expensive. It is the most expensive place to live in Tokyo, ergo Japan. Now, I was in this bar with my friend Andy. Andy was a financier, worked for one of the big British banks in the in the UK and he, we used to go out to these bars around where he lived. I mean, he were making a fucking fortune, but he was still having to share a, an apartment with another with another banker. So we would go drinking around these bars. Now, we were in this bar and there were a woman that were just sort of hanging about around us and she won with anybody so i'd got a few in me so i just invited her over and she was it turns out she was 15 year older than me so if i were 35 she was 50 didn't look 50 because she were asian taiwanese so got chatting and within i would say 10 minutes she was telling me her husband goes nowhere near her and all that sort of stuff so basically, within half an hour of being in that bar, she had picked me up. My friend Andy said, right, I'll see you when I see you. And off he went with the rest of the lads. So what happened there was we, we spoke for a while. She gave me a business card and she said, come round to my office at this time on Monday. So it was a Sunday night and the Monday morning. So I went about my work in Tokyo and I went round, I didn't go round to her office, we met in a coffee shop just round the corner from where she lived. So I met in the coffee shop and she sat me down and she basically got to know me better while we were both sober. Now, what I didn't know at the time is this goes on all the time in Tokyo, all the time. And what she were doing was she were interviewing me to see if I was somebody she could spend time with. She were a very powerful and a very rich woman. She were at the top of her game in the business that she had. And she just wanted a play thing. And I was more than willing to fill in there. So, again, the next day she invited me back but we were invited round to her office. Now, she had, it looked like, various staff members that worked for her. Because when I turned up, the office were empty, completely empty. The curtains were drawn, um, and it was three o'clock in the afternoon. So she had just said to her staff, go home. I'm giving you afternoon off, go home. So I went round there. She, as soon as I walked in, shoes off. She said, "Did you did you cycle here?" And I went, "Yeah." And it were summer. It would have been summer because it was really hot. And she said, "Right, there's a shower there." And I went, "All right." And I had to go get showered. I had to get clean. What the fuck's going on here? So. I'm in there, I'm getting showered, I'm drying myself off. And as I'm drying myself off, she just walks in. I am bollocko, bollocko. She just walks in and she said to me, don't get dressed. I'm like, All right. You do what you've got to do. You do what you've got to do. So for the, pat, for the, the next, I think it was two months, I just became this woman's plaything. Now, the sweetener about this is every time I would get the call, we'd go and meet somewhere and she would drop me an envelope. Now, in that envelope would be 40,000 yen. Now, 40,000 yen back then, 40,000 yen, 816, 300 quid. 
So whatever 300 quid is back then, that now the, it's changed now. So I'd probably be getting about 150, which I would still do. Um, so yeah, she just dropped me an envelope. So I was a prostitute for two months, a willing one at that. I wasn't getting trafficked. I was in my mid thirties. Everybody was happy. Everybody was happy. Now, in Tokyo, there is a place called the Tokyo American Club. Now, if you don't know what the Tokyo American Club is, you can Google it. And what it stands for really is, is a big fucking building where all the biggest fucking pricks you have ever met in your life, who have ever crawled the face of this earth, they can all gather and meet in this building and they can do business deals and they can turn into even bigger fucking knobheads than they already are. And it's called the Tokyo American Club. You've got to pay a fucking fortune to join. You've got to pay a fortune every time you go in there and everything's expensive. Now, what happens is because the wives of these fellas do not give a fuck anymore and they want to start taking the piss because their their husbands or their partners are just just going round all the brothels and the the prostitutes in Tokyo and in Japan and just banging the way through that and and these wives are sick of it so they go and parade the playthings i.e. me in this Tokyo American club so one day the day that I finally stopped being a plaything I was taken to the Tokyo American club so you go in you get signed in and I were looking at this place I was like, fucking hell it's 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 a great place there's there's a swimming pool there's a gym restaurants there's a bar hot all high spec quality stuff so we were sat there at this table by ourselves and then this other couple turned up and it were a Canadian woman with a Canadian fella now there was some off with these two and it took me about five minutes to work it out after they were speaking that the woman the Canadian woman that were with the Canadian fella were doing the same as what this woman were doing with me. She had her plaything, and it just happened to be that they were both the same nationality. She were sick of her husband, sick and tired of him banging all these Asian hookers, these high-class Asian hookers, and she'd caught him, and she were parading her piece about in Tokyo American Club. Now, I were chatting with him, and then the women that we were, we were chatting with each other. And they got up, the women, and, and off they went. And I were talking to him. And he didn't seem, he seemed to be a bit worried. And I was saying, well, what are you worried about? Is she paying you? He said, oh, oh, yeah, she's paying me. And it turns out he were getting double what I were getting. I said, well, where's she getting her money from? And he proceeded to tell me that she was the wife of the fella who is the top boss of an American arms dealer in the Asia Pacific. So the woman that he was with who was dropping him 80, 90, 100,000 yen per date was the head of this arms dealing com company in the Asia Pacific. And this woman were becoming increasingly more demanding in the bedroom when she'd take him off to hotels that he would show me the cuts that he had on him. 
and he couldn't tell her to stop because she was saying to him, if you fucking refuse any of this, you know who my husband is and you're not going to be about for much longer. So he was, he was scared. The fellow was scared. So I'm going, well, how, can you get out of it? Can you get away? He said, well, I can, but I need the money. He said, if I, if I go, if I, if I hang about with her for another couple of months, he said, I'm going to be set. I'm going to be set for at least 10 years and I'll just be able to get off into the wind and I'll be gone. So he was just going to hang about with her for a couple of more months and then travel the world for I don't know how many years. Jesus Christ, if I could get, I were already, me, me, me mind were turning over. If I could get another couple like, like them, I, I wouldn't have to do, I wouldn't have to work, work for a while. Anyway, they come back and obviously they'd been off to order the, the food. And I got the distinct feeling from this American woman that she wanted to make a fool of me. She wanted to get one over on the woman that I were with by putting me down. Now, she obviously thought that I were the same as this Canadian fellow that, that she were with. And I don't think she'd had many experiences with Yorkshiremen. So the starter come. And we'd got this soup, this lobster soup. And it was put in front of her. And she said something that was so privileged and so fucking white that it sticks with me to this day almost 18 years after the fact. 18 years after the fact, I still think about what she said at least... Once a week? At least once a week. So it's put down in front of us. And she she looks at the soup and she looks at my soup and she said, Do you know this is the best shallow water lobster bisque you will get outside of New England? But why would you ever know that? And then she she put her head down and she started to she started to eat a soup and she just give herself a little snigger. Now, my inner voice, my inner Yorkshireman just said, oh, just take it, Walt. Just take it. Sit back, take it, shut your mouth. You're on a good thing here. You know, just carry on eating your soup. Now, you'd think that. Me today, I'd probably just let it go because when somebody's saying something like that, they've got bigger fish to fry than what you have but no i couldn't i couldn't let it go and i said how can how can you you're the wife of a man who sells death you're the wife of a man who sells death you do nothing but come here and parade parade your fella around who you are cutting in a hotel room. That's how you're getting your kicks, by cutting a fella that you pay for. Now, old Canadian fella, he's got his head down in the soup, just shaking his head. And he's just going, shut up, shut up, shut up. And that just sort of poured fuel on the fire for me. I says, how, what do you get out of putting me down? I'm going to go home and laugh about you. Do you never think I've had bisque before, a lobster bisque before? Well, I've not. I've not. And let me tell you, it were, it were nice. And whatever they're doing in New England, fuck me, I'll, I'll have to try that a bit later down the road. But she was just trying to get one over on me. I said, your husband is, is selling death and destruction to all of the countries in Asia Pacific. And you're coming at me talking about trying to put me down, talking about your soup. Your soup. That's how you're getting your kicks. Bragging that I don't know, bragging that you know more about me about soup. And then you're going away with your fella after we've finished the soup and you're going to cut him in a bedroom while he's got a mask on. 
you know, and you, you're having a go at me about soup. I don't give a fuck about your soup and I don't give a fuck about you. Don't try and think you're better than me just because your husband makes money through killing kids. Now, just as I said the word kids, an arm comes on me wrist. And it were a, it were a sort of grip that, that tells you to stop. And it were the woman that I were with. Now, she, she had her arm on my wrist and then the American woman could see what were happening. And the American woman said to the woman I was with, Get your dog on the get your dog on a leash, will you? Get your dog on a leash. So up and off we went. Now we're walking through reception. So just as I got the word kids out, I felt an arm on my wrist. So just as I So just as I got the word kids out, I felt an hand on me on my knee and a squeeze and I, I took that as a a sign to shut the fuck up. So I just waited for her to reply to me. Now she was quickly put into two and two together that the Canadian bloke had told me everything while they'd gone and made their orders. Now, I don't know if they'd gone up to make their orders or they'd gone up just to talk about us because there were waiters milling about. Yeah, I do wonder about that. Anyway, he's still not got his head up from soup. She's... How dare you talk to me like that? How dare you? Do you know who my husband is and what he could do to you? I says, I know fully well what he could do to me because your fella there has been telling me. He shitted himself. Look at him. So we all looked at him, still got his head down. And I noticed there were a bit of a tremble. So he were, he were worrying about his own safety, I expect. Anyway. We were excused. The woman I were with, she stood me up and she walked me off to the reception. As I'm walking off to the reception, she's just shaking her head. She's shaking her head. Why can't you just, why can't, why couldn't you just keep your mouth shut? We had a good thing here. We had a good thing here. I think the next, and then she said to me, I think the next one I get, I'm going to have to keep on a tighter leash. I thought, Anyway, we get to the reception. She said, this is the last time we will see each other. This is the last time we will see each other. I won't contact you again. Don't contact me. And then she reached into her handbag and she pulled out four envelopes. She said, this is the money that I keep every month for you. And this would have been the first week of the month. She gave me the four envelopes. So, rather than, I mean, I, I'm, not a, I'm not one for begging. I'm not one for begging. But rather than say, look, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. I said, all right then. I said, I just can't, I can't keep me, uh, I can't keep my mouth shut. My, 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 my wrong, my wrong. So, so she reached in her bag and she pulled out four envelopes. She said, this was the money I was going to give you for this month, but we're not going to see each other again. I won't contact you again. Don't contact me. Here's the, here's the month's money. Oh, hell, it's Christmas. And off I went, and I never saw that woman again, and I never saw the Canadian woman. No, I never saw the American woman, and I knew the Canadian fella's name and every, every so often I'll look for him. Um, after that Tokyo American Club thing, I found him more or less straight away on Facebook. 
And this would have been in 2006, 2007. So we were there on Facebook. And then about three weeks after that, he disappeared. He disappeared. His, his, uh, his Facebook profile just wasn't there anymore. Now, I don't know if he'd put it to private. I don't know if he'd found me and, and blocked me. But I haven't seen him since. Now, I'm just wondering if he's holding some bridge up somewhere in Hiroshima or it carried on with the dates with this woman or the woman took it too far in the hotel and killed him or her husband just fucking finished him off. I have no idea, but he went missing. He went, he went dark, shall we say, as they say in the business. But these rich and powerful women are out there in Tokyo and in Japan. And they are looking for these young, free and single playthings just to just to get to fill in jobs that their husbands should be doing. Now, I'm too old for that game now, and I'm not going to go back to it because I'm a very happily married man with a family. But I'm just telling you, if you're coming here and you're coming here single, you can make some fucking cheddar. Make some cheddar doing things you enjoy. But watch out for the Western women that want to do that sort of stuff with you because they're not worth it. They're not worth it. And they've got rich and powerful husbands who can make you disappear. So that's my advice to you. Anyway, that's that and that's that. So I'm going to go out in this weather to the supermarket. I'm going to probably get wet through. And I'm going to come back and edit all this for your listening delight. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next week for episode 150. Goodbye, everybody. Adios.